We are about to enjoy our invited keynote lecture for 2022. Our keynote speakers are always international experts and often are invited to talk on topics that are somewhat outside our usual fare. That is the case again this year. A little bit more speech than voice, but invariably their insights give us ideas. The way they approach problems provides new concepts for us and very often they result in collaborations and new research. This year we are honored to have Christina Simonian with us. She is Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School and Director of Laryngology Research at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Her primary clinical research focuses on focal dystonias and a small sampling of the rest of her many accomplishments can be found on page six of your program. So I could use up all of her time saying nice things about her, but I will not. Dr. Simone.
There are also segmental forms of dystonia that affect adjacent body uh, regions, and the most severe is generalized, where it starts usually in childhood and spreads from legs up uh, to the trunk and involves also the larynx and um, facial muscles. Another definition of dystonia divides them into non task specifics that affect um, non volitional behavior such as neck positioning, eye blinking, and task specific uh, that affects uh, highly learned behavior such as speech production, laryngeal dystonia, writing, the writer's cram, or uh, playing a musical instrument in musician dystonia. So, laryngeal dystonia involves involuntary spams in laryngeal muscles. It is a task specific uh, disorder, uh, meaning that voices are affected uh, during uh, speech, uh, voice speech uh, predominantly, but not during uh, whispered speech or emotional vocalizations such as uh, laughter or crying. Here, here are some examples of this task specificity. Could you please play the video here? He's hiding behind the house. He is hiding behind the house. Hurry. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. Now, compare this to a whispering uh, of same sentences as well as singing. He is hiding behind the house. He is hiding behind the house. Hurry. Helen is far ahead. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. Day to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Much easier though. Singing, especially happy birthday, involve all this voiceless uh, consonant that the patient was breaking um, in uh, spasms during speaking. Symptom onset is usually at around 40 years of age. Uh, it predominantly affects white uh, females with 4 to 1 ratio. There are different clinical phenotypes, including the most common reductor form, where hyperreduction of vocal folds leads to breaks of vowels and harsh uh, voice quality. Could you please play the sample? has a rabbit in his hat. I went to get apple for Sally and patted the fat lamb. And we'll catch a cold if he doesn't have a hat. Jack set on attack. Less common, uh, Dr. Laryngeal Vistania causes um, spasms in the adductor muscle and slow vocal fold closure, prolonging voiceless consonants and resulting in better quality of voice. Could you please play? He's hiding behind the house. Hurry! Helen's far ahead. He has gone home because he's hungry. There are other forms that are much rarer, including a singer's laryngeal dystonia, which is a subtype of laryngeal dystonia and musician's dystonia, and uh, involves symptoms uh, that are characteristic of both adductor and adductor forms, as well as adductor respiratory laryngeal dystonia, where adductor laryngeal spasms occur during inspiration. The result is a stridor dyspnea and obstruction. There are possibly different uh, genotypes as well, uh, as there are reports of up to 25% of patients having family history of dystonia. Now, uh, a little bit about terminology, laryngeal dystonia. Here is a brief history. The first um, description of a patient with what we now consider laryngeal dystonia was given by Traube in 1871 and he uh, named this uh, condition as uh, spastic dysphonia. Later on, uh, Schnitzler, Schnitzler in 1895 described uh, patients with so-called phonic laryngeal spasms 
uh, that are consistent with our adapter uh, type uh, currently, and spastic aphonia, which is uh, similar to adapter LD. Later on, uh, Franco um, used different other um, terminologies like, like monophonia for slowly developing uh, voice symptoms, but he also made an important comparison uh, with focal hand dystonia. Now, Gowers in uh, 1899 described functional laryngeal spasms uh, while speaking, uh, laying grounds for our understanding of task specificity in this disorder. And of course, uh, fast forward about a century or so, Aronson uh, coined the term spasmodic dysphonia. He formally characterized adductor and abductor pipes, and he helped establish that laryngeal dystonia is not a psychiatric condition. In the 80s, Blitzer, uh, and Marston's groups independently characterized uh, laryngeal dystonia as focal dystonia. And Blitzer in 1985 used laryngeal dystonia as a term in his publication. Following this, uh, Shepherd and Ludlow provided EMG evidence that laryngeal dystonia is a motor control disorder. And later on, uh, Blitzer and Brin described a doctor laryngeal breathing dystonia, now classified as a doctor respiratory laryngeal dystonia. And Cara um, in Blitzer's group again uh, described uh, singer's dystonia. Just recently, a group of experts uh, met uh, at NIDCD's workshop uh, on this disorder and uh, we adopted the term of laryngeal dystonia instead of spasmodic dystonia to accurately reflect uh, the current uh, nomenclature of movement disorders and uh, also to reflect the progress in characterization of this disorder. So uh, there where we are uh, currently in terms of terminology. So going forward, uh, I try to use laryngeal dystonia as much as I can, although sometimes I revert on saying spasmodic dystonia too. So uh, my journey through um, the research journey through laryngeal dystonia has been quite fulfilling. Um, I arrived to uh, Christy Lago's lab at NIH in 2004 and she handed me what looks now as a black box uh, with a question, do you know what changes we can find in the nervous system in this patient? Looking back into literature, there was a single case report of PET study in a single patient with spasmodic dysphonia by Hirana. Uh, published in 2021 that described some uh, abnormalities in brain activity. So we took that and moved forward into understanding disease pathophysiology that I will be focusing um, for the remaining of my talk that led us eventually to uh, developing some novel diagnostic and therapeutic opportunities. And I really look forward into where we will get in maybe five to ten years uh, in uh, how we will accurately and objectively diagnose and provide better treatment to these patients. So uh, back then, even back then, we knew that uh, dystonia as well as laryngeal dystonia pathophysiology is not limited only to uh, brain alterations. Uh, there are also environmental or risk, extrinsic and intrinsic risk factors that are involved in this disease, as well as genetic underpinnings. So uh, we um, dissected this pathophysiology uh, into different studies, and I want to walk you through all uh, the results and findings that we had that formed further our approaches to treatment and diagnosis. So brain organization, this was one of the first studies that we conducted um, in patients with both abductor and abductor uh, spasmodic dysphonia or laryngeal dystonia compared to healthy subjects. Importantly, in this study, we asked uh, healthy subjects to imitate the voice train and effort of patients. And we also asked them to produce not only symptomatic formation of EE, that would be symptomatic for adductor form, and EE for abductor form, but also we asked them to uh, do voluntary coughing, voluntary breathing, as well as whimpering, which sounded like, hmm, hmm. Uh, people often ask how it sounds. <laughs> and, uh, 
meaning that we wanted to capture um, brain activity not only during symptomatic um, uh, phonation, but also during some vocal tasks and during chill tasks that do not involve symptoms. So what we found was that uh, brain activity is um, highly increased in patients, as you see here on this brain um, the surfaces, with blue showing increased activity and with red, orange showing decreased activity compared to healthy subjects. These patterns were quite similar in both adductor and abductor form. What was interesting that uh, even during asymptomatic uh, um, whimpering, coughing, and breathing, some of these abnormalities uh, were preserved, and uh, specifically in sensory motor areas, while basal ganglia and uh, thalamic and cerebellar changes were pretty much normalized during asymptomatic um, reproduction or laryngeal behavior. Uh, we also looked into how uh, these uh, regional abnormalities interact or don't interact with each other. And uh, coming from a healthy subject, we constructed so called uh, local networks uh, where we looked how, for example, uh, motor cortex uh, interacts with sensory areas, with basal ganglia, with cerebellum, and so on. Um, when we looked into patients with both adductor and abductor forms, we noticed here that this network, this local network, is quite abnormal in both forms. However, you can also see that uh, adductor and abductor um, patients are somewhat different, which led us thinking that there may be some uh, phenotypically driven changes that occur in the brain of these patients. So uh, the take-home message from this would be that there is a normal, uh, mostly increased brain activity during both symptomatic and asymptomatic tasks, and asymptomatic abnormalities may represent an endophenotypic trait. There's also the altered original connectivity within the sensory motor network, and as I already mentioned, clinical phenotypes uh, seem to impact the extent of this abnormal connectivity. So the uh, question uh, rose then uh, whether dystonia or laryngeal dystonia in particular is a basal ganglia disorder as it is characterized in all textbooks, or is it rather a neural network disorder? So um, we started looking into uh, neural networks. And to start with that, I want to walk you through of what we can gain by examining large-scale networks. These are complex systems and they exist in everywhere. Uh, networks are integrated. For example, on the first figure, you see that uh, different layers of um, uh, cortex and different uh, regions, as well as white and gray matter uh, connectivity patterns. As you can see, there is some level of integration. Some regions are grouped together and they interact uh, more with each other than with others. At the same time, uh, diametrically opposing to these networks are segregated, which means that they form these clusters of neural communities. And it is important to understand how these networks are formed because they can inform how we approach these patients or how we treat or diagnose and so on. Here you see healthy younger, younger adults and healthy older adults. Uh, nothing wrong with these um, networks, they're just different. And it is important to know this, uh, in this case, age-driven changes in networks in order to know what to do next. Networks also depend on uh, information transfer hubs. These are regions that, uh, for example, connect different neural com communities, so-called connector hubs, or provincial hubs. Uh, that connect communities within uh, their group. So think of this as the federal government versus state government with different, um, uh, uh, with different levels of responsibilities. So uh, looking into patients with laryngeal dystonia, we uh, noticed here that uh, these networks are disorganized. Uh, you see the, uh, on the top figure, Different neural communities are represented with different colors, uh, spheres. Uh, spheres represent different brain regions. And you can see that in uh, patients, there is normal formation of isolated neural community in the basal ganglia and thalamus. 
as well as there is abnormal information transfer by parietal and sensorimotor neural communities, meaning that the spheres are reorganized in their color, if you want to see this visually. Now, about hops, as I mentioned, these are um, important regions of information transfer that hold the network activity. And looking into patients with laryngeal dystonia, you see how profoundly these uh, hops um, uh, change. Uh, they alter in a way that the connector hops, the top federal government, is pretty much gone. Uh, and it is replaced by a lower um, uh, low governance, lower governance provincial hubs. However, there is not one-to-one -one replacement, so there is actually uh, this change in uh, this loss uh, and gain of poor network hubs dictates the uh, larger network architecture and in a way the entire network becomes disorganized. So um, I'm sometimes asked um, how people walk and talk if their brain networks are this disorganized. It is important to um, realize that this is really relevant to speech production since these are, pa this are patients with uh, voice and speech disorder and they were doing uh, activity uh, during a scanning, fMRI scanning that is relevant directly to their symptoms. So these are very uh, specifically, very specific disorganization of their speech production networks. So moving on into different um, clinical phenotypes and potential genotypes, um, you would notice uh, severe disruption uh, that are very uh, uh, severe disruptions that are very characteristic to each of these forms of, of dystonia. Adductor and abductor are quite different, so are sporadic and familial forms of laryngeal dystonia. So uh, this provided with really the uh, core understanding of how brain networks are disorganized in laryngeal dystonia, and let us um, exam to examining um, what are the mechanisms of uh, these network alterations. Uh, for this, uh, we looked into uh, how brain regions interact with each other, but in a slightly different way. Using so-called dynamic causal modeling, modeling we examined how uh, information, uh, what is the directionality of information transfer from one region to the other. And here you see in circles uh, brain regions that were specifically abnormal in these uh, patients with laryngeal dystonia, and you see the uh, under group effect, you see how they are similar to healthy volunteers. And on the right, you see what was the difference uh, between uh, patients and uh, controls. What we found was not really mainstream uh, understanding of this disorder and uh, dystonia in general. Again, um, textbook example of basal ganglia disorder. We actually found that uh, the putamen is being influenced by parietal uh, cortex uh, and premotor cortex and alterations rather than um, in the reverse order uh, where the general knowledge at that time was that um, the disorder potentially originates from the basal ganglia. So um, this helped us also form a new understanding of uh, not only laryngeal dystonia but dystonia in general. Uh, research um, um, around the time when I started looking into this disorder was prevailing in its models of basal ganglia disorder, as you can see here, a med search of uh, papers claiming uh, what kind of disorder it would be. Uh, and um, our research, as well as research from other labs, of course, uh, informed, further informed uh, field that uh, there are regions that are responsible for endophenotypic traits, there are regions that are responsible for the clinical uh, correlations with the disorder, and there are, of course, for um, abnormalities in this large scale network of this organization. So, where we are now is that the field uh, um, predominantly thinks that this is a neural network disorder. And uh, this is opening further opportunities into understanding how we can um, address patients in terms of their clinical management. So, uh, briefly about genes and their influence, 
uh, Regiovistone is a rare disorder. Most cases are sporadic. And as I mentioned, familial dystonia has uh, reduced penetrance uh, at 12 to 25 percent, depending on the publication. Large families are difficult to identify, and the affected family members are closely related. These are all challenges we have been facing in identifying single genes that are involved specifically or causing specifically laryngeal dystonia. However, there are a few genes uh, such as DYT1, DYT6, and DYT25 that involve gen generalized or segmental uh, forms of dystonia and they do have also laryngeal involvement. These patients do experience uh, laryngeal dystonia but that's part of um, that are generalized in segmental forms. There is only one report that um, uh, identified a patient with the YT25 uh, focal laryngeal dystonia. Uh, the patient did not have any other forms of dystonia. So while that's in progress, We've looked into poly polygenic risk score of dystonia, which quantifies the aggregate uh, effect of uh, alleles associated with the disorder. Uh, it was done um, using whole exam next generation sequencing uh, of 57 patients, and we computed polygenic risk score based on 18, over 1,800 genetic markers uh, from GWAS study in patients with. Um, related form of focal dystonia, right strand and positions dystonia. What we found uh, was that polygenic risk uh, score, uh, risk uh, of laryngeal dystonia depends uh, on this enrichment gene of genes associated with uh, synapses, neuron projection, synaptic transmission, and neuronal development. Interestingly, we also found that polygenic risk is associated with vulnerable uh, connectivity of sensory motor and inferior parietal cortices. And it's also uh, linked to symptom, um, uh, it's correlated with uh, uh, symptom, uh, oh, sorry, with age of onset um, uh, of disorder. So uh, this, uh, Knowledge, you know, we linked uh, brain alterations, uh, symptomatology, and genetics, and um, is guiding our way to identifying specific genes that are causing uh, that are positive of uh, regional dystonia. Finally, uh, risk factors. Um, uh, we conducted a, a large survey in uh, patients with laryngeal dystonia, and uh, this is a known fact, uh, but uh, the study as well confirmed that females have higher prevalence, uh, so it serves as a risk factor, so are, uh, so is white race. We also found that professional voice use, uh, family history, and psychiatric history uh, may serve as predisposing factors for uh, to developing laryngeal dystonia. Further on, we found that upper respiratory uh, infections and uh, birth, uh, as well as neck injury and surgery, may serve as extrinsic risk factors. And again, linking back these two um, uh, neural uh, alterations, um, similar regions, the ones that we were finding to be uh, involved with genetic risk, uh, have shown again uh, um, relationship association with extrinsic risk factors, uh, contributing as potentially triggers to developing uh, to, manifest, to the manifestation of uh, uh, voice symptoms in these patients. So just to supplement this figure, uh, we can also place uh, gene association and polygenic risk with extrinsic risk on this um, diagram. Now, how um, understanding and, uh, the pathophysiology of laryngeal dystonia can inform our diagnostics uh, of this disorder? Dystonia is the third most common movement disorder uh, with estimated prevalence of up to 35 uh, per 100,000, as I already mentioned earlier. And up to half of cases are misdiagnosed uh, at the first encounter. Why this happens? Because there are no biomarkers for dystonia as an indicator of a common pathophysiological process. There is no gold standard uh, test. And the diagnosis is uh, formulated purely on clinical syndrome characteristics. 
here you see the vicious a circle of patients going um, through different exams uh, and clinicians until uh, the diagnosis is um, confirmed. Moreover, there is a phenotypical variability of dystonia and other conditions mimicking dystonia as well as laryngeal dystonia like muscle tension dystonia contribute to this uncertainty. Finally, there is expertise and experience of clinician that in many cases um, um, either makes the diagnosis very fast or delays it for months and years. In any event, uh, the reliability, specificity, and sensitivity of this current approach is not established, and that's true for all forms of dystonia. The validity of clinical diagnosis without, without a biomarker cannot be assessed. So uh, what's happening uh, currently that a uh, few studies have looked into this and determined that uh, typical patients with, patients with laryngeal dystonia would require about four office visits and the uh, uh, delays in diagnosis may take up to, on average, five and a half years. Uh, we're not doing well in uh, terms of timelines, but it's not even as uh, bad as in other forms of dystonia, for example, in some other focal forms of dystonia, like writer's cramp, the delays may be after 10 years. So, not that that's great, but to put it into perspective. The consensus between physicians is hard to achieve. A recent study has shown that the agreement to agree between expert clinicians is as low as 34%, which is below chess, and chess is 50%. Uh, this approach open to bias and misdiagnosis um, with estimates uh, that only about 5% of patients receive accurate diagnosis and symptom onset. And finally, it uh, defers treatment. So, um, we thought that we can use our current knowledge of disorder pathophysiology to discover a biomarker of significant diagnostic potential and to develop objective platforms for its diagnosis. So, the idea was that if somebody uh, comes, um, shows up in the clinic, um, and we see that uh, the patient has voice problems, um, we may suggest examining the brain, why the brain? Because it's a neurological disorder. And in addition to voice, it's always good to look for the cause of the problem. And if we have a platform that can make some predictions and the platform is validated, we might uh, inform our decision making about the diagnosis not purely based on our subjective observations, but also verified with a computer, like on this cartoon. And you may agree or you may not agree, it's not to replace any clinician, it's just to aid in decision making. So with that, um, through some years of other relevant machine learning uh, research that I don't have uh, time to talk about right now, we, uh, we got to using deep learning um, in developing a platform that's called DystoniaNet uh, that automatically uh, discovered a biomarker based on raw structural brain MRI. Why uh, structural MRI? Because all fancy functional imaging uh, that we have done and found all these fancy networks and so on that are practically impossible to do in the clinical setting. They don't care any translational potential. So we wanted to develop something that would be easy to acquire uh, in the clinic. Um, clinicians do this uh, regularly anyway and can be used uh, in diagnostic um, uh, decision making within a short period of time. So we developed this a 3D convolutional neural network architecture that um, uh, which uh, uh, after we visualized it uh, in our workings uh, we found that it discovered the biomarker uh, in brain regions that are known uh, to uh, contribute not only to alterations in laryngeal dystonia, but also on the spectrum of pretty much all forms of dystonia, including secondary forms and um, you know, forms that are due to stroke and so on. So we thought it would be a unifying diagnostic biomarker. 
uh, we had to test it though. So we were uh, fortunate enough to have a very large number of patients and help the controls so collected over years of uh, research. And uh, our independent testing set showed that the Estonian net outperformed all other uh, shallow um, machine learning algorithms by uh, um, great significance and also showed high sensitivity, specificity, as well as PPV and NPV uh, values. Further optimizing the Estonia net, uh, we removed the uh, presence of healthy subjects because healthy subjects will not come to the clinic to see a laryngologist or speech language pathologist. There's no need for that. So all we need to deal with are patients. And we also included the triage um, as a referral. So referral uh, reduces misrepresentations uh, of the algorithm, so it increases its accuracy, but also provides um, uh, the so-called gray zone where a patient is either um, comes out as uh, having high probability of dystonia or low probability of dystonia, or in this gray zone, we need to still see uh, how symptoms would develop. So we further tested it on a larger data set of patients with uh, other forms of dystonia, including laryngeal dystonia, and the accuracy of algorithm was quite high at 98.8%, high at with a referral of 3.5%. Importantly, the diagnostic time per case was under a second. Now, uh, looking into um, additional, uh, additional validations, we used um, nearly 1,500 healthy subjects to examine their accuracy, um, in, uh, to examine the accuracy of the platform in diagnosing the fact that there are healthy subjects, and the algorithm was 96.9% accurate. So, uh, could you please play the video here? So, the uh, automated platform uh, works um, uh, like this. Um, you basically need to upload the uh, Nifty or Tycom image of raw structural brain MRI that can be acquired in a clinical setting or research setting. And the algorithm shows the probability of a patient uh, or health subject having dystonia. So, could you please advance? Now, um, the ideal situation would be again to um, aid decision making for diagnosis and um, shorten the period from first visit to diagnosis and shorten the period from first visit, diagnosis, and treatment. Uh, but the features uh, of this unifying biomarker and its uh, diagnostic platform are that it's objective. There was no manual involvement in teaching uh, the, or training the platform on what the platform needs to see or should see. It is accurate with overall accuracy of 98.8% compared to a agreement rate of 34% between clinicians. It's fast. Uh, it's cost effective, can be done within a single visit. Uh, it's generalizable as it, uh, it is highly accurate across different forms of dystonia, and it is validated not only on a large number of test subjects, but also on different large testing sets. Uh, our ongoing research supported by NDS right now is conducting multiple, uh, a multi-center clinical trial where we're testing this platform uh, in the clinic. We're also developing extensions to its differential diagnosis with other conditions and predictive assessment of treatment outcomes. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about treatment and how understanding the pathophysiology informed uh, our ways of thinking about treatment. Botulinum toxin is considered a gold standard uh, therapy, and we'll talk about this a little more. Um, oral medications um, are sometimes given to patients uh, to um, relieve anxiety, depression, or just to um, basically use on trial and error uh, approach to see if anything works. There are no selectively designed and FDA approved oral medications for laryngeal dystonia or pretty much any other form of dystonia. 
Laryngeal surgery has also been tried uh, originally with heart nerve section, has been quite successful. Um, selective laryngeal innervation, innervation, type 2 thyroplasty, uh, laser myotomy, peripheral nerve stimulation. The list grows every time I go to another otolaryngology meeting. Uh, however, about uh, one third of patients with laryngeal dystonia do not receive any treatment at all. So, uh, botulinum toxin shows a usually phenotype dependent efficacy with 90% uh, doctor LD receiving about 90% benefit and 10% of doctor LD receiving about 70% benefit. Symptoms are never completely resolved in most cases and benefits are usually seen for only 30% of injection cycle. Over half of uh, injected patients have side effects. Injections must be repeated every three or four months for life, and about 40% of patients receive no clear benefits. All this said, this is something that is available to manage symptoms temporarily, and the beauty of botulinum neurotoxin treatment is that it's a reversible treatment until other treatments are developed. So patients who do benefit should continue getting injections. <coughs> uh, yeah, and it's not approved by FDA. So, uh, looking into how the um, botulinum toxin may um, change pathophysiology we did the literature search and we found out that most of the studies examined uh, the effects of the toxin treatment at the peak of efficacy when patients have the most benefits at one to one half months uh, after injection. So, we really didn't know what the longer term effect of um, uh, this treatment either at the end of the cycle or longitudinally. So um, we took our large cohort of patients and first compared them to healthy controls to see that they do display the abnormalities that are generally found in this disorder. But then we divided them into um, toxin naive and toxin treated. And interestingly, there was one region in the spiroparietal lobal percutaneous area where we saw uh, that um, benefited patients had less activity than treated, or vice versa, treated patients, uh, uh, naive patients, sorry, naive patients had um, still preserved more activity than uh, treated patients. Looking into benefited and not benefited patients, uh, interestingly, this area was again active in those patients uh, who benefited from treatment. So, uh, the, uh, we concluded that uh, left procunius uh, may be a site of short-term um, toxin central effects. Uh, these are all patients that were um, studied at the end of their injection cycle. So, how about longitudinally? Um, this got even more interesting because we had patients who had treatment between one year and 28 years. So we arbitrarily um, uh, split them into different groups um, of about five year duration uh, for their treatment. And you can see here that patients who have a shorter and very uh, longer treatment durations, they have additional hyperactivity compared to patients who are in the middle, like 6 to 12 years of treatment. Again, this arbitrary stratification, there were really no guidelines on how to stratify uh, these patients, so we took uh, our best approach we could think of. It looks like this prefrontal cerebellar axis may be a site of longer term uh, toxin treatment duration effect. And uh, potentially there is a cyclicity of um, benefits that patients are getting. Uh, importantly, we did not find that there are any direct effects on sensory motor uh, network of dystonic speech production. So it seems like all these effects are more of an indirect um, association through the regions that project uh, or are connected with motor cortical outputs. So, uh, designing pathophysiologically defined treatments for laryngeal dystonia has been on our mind for a while. And um, I used to hear from patients all the time that glass of wine helps their symptoms. Um, you know, glass of wine helps 
many things. <laughs> so I wasn't paying attention to that too much, but then I noticed that more and more patients are mentioning this. So at some point, we did a study, this online survey study of 641 patients over three weeks, and we asked number of questions, not specifically directed to alcohol effects because we wanted to tuck it in, not make very, you know, uh, explicit, um, not to, uh, you know, uh, think, make them think about alcohol response and something specific that they need to um, respond about. So what we found uh, was that um, over 50%, close to 60% of patients would uh, have uh, significant symptom improvement after um, between one uh, to three drinks and um, we also asked them if their relatives or friends uh, notice speech improvement, voice improvement because you know it may be just the effect of the alcohol and about the same percentage did say that their uh, friends and relatives uh, notice that their voice is improved. So um, I have two examples of a patient with alcohol responsive laryngeal dystonia. Could you please play first video on the left? From the farm? Are you going far from the farm? My father has a new car. My father has a new car. I hurt my arm on the iron bar. I hurt my arm on the iron bar. Are the olives large? Are the olives large? John argued ardently about honesty. John argued ardently about honesty. And the second one, please. And this is after two shots of vodka. <laughs> shots. No, I argued ardently about honesty. John argued ardently about honesty. He is hiding behind the house. He is hiding behind the house. Harry, Helen is far ahead. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. We did that cognitive test. She was not drunk. <laughs> um, later on, in another study through the Estonia Coalition, where they have collection and data from all forms of Estonia, basically confirmed our initial finding that. Yes, all forms of Estonia seem to have some percentage of patients who do respond to alcohol. So why it's important? Because yeah. alcohol mimics the effects of GABA on the brain. And why GABA is important is because loss, there is a loss of uh, GABAergic function and that leads to loss of inhibition, or partly is leading to loss of inhibition. And that contributes to abnormally increased brain activity. So the idea was, by using alcohol or some form of alcohol or some supplement of alcohol, we can directly influence GABAergic function, increase GABAergic uh, function, and decrease normal brain activity. So we can't prescribe alcohol. <laughs> 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 However, we can prescribe sodium oxalate, uh, which mimics the effects of alcohol. So, alcohol mimics GABA, sodium oxalate mimics alcohol. Um, sodium oxalate is GABA hydroxybutyric acid. It, when ingested orally, it absorbs uh, quickly across this uh, blood brain barrier and importantly converts into GABA within the brain. It is FDA approved for cataplexy, excessive daytime slipness in narcolepsy, and, and idiopathic hypersomnia. So, uh, in our own label study, we had patients with laryngeal dystonia, as well laryngeal dystonia and tremor, and we found that sodium oxalate is effective in about 74% of these patients. Well, of course, the their uh, yeah, symptom improvement starts uh, in about 14 minutes and it takes um, uh, about uh, three and a half, four hours of good voice when they benefit from treatment. We of course looked into brain and what we noticed that um, 
patients who benefit uh, from this treatment, they have uh, their brain activity looks um, very close to normal, close to healthy subjects. Here you see um, in purple regions of brain that are modulated both in benefiting and non-benefiting patients. Um, because it's centrally active, you would expect that the non-benefiting get some central effects. But in patients who are benefiting, you see the effect is much wider spread. These are all green areas that are typically uh, highly active, but they are, um, the activity is lower after um, one hour of uh, after treatment. So uh, I have a um, couple of videos to show you how it looks in drug responders and non-responders. This is the patient you saw previously in the first slide. Uh, could you please play uh, the videos? Uh, this is before treatment. She is hiding behind the house. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. So, the doctor is from Allergio Estonia. This is about 50 minutes after treatment. He is hiding behind the house. He is hiding behind the house. Hurry, home is far ahead. Hurry, home is far ahead. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. <laughs> so the first video, he was really struggling with sentences, and they do not like the sentence. We specifically made them very challenging for them. The second video, he was pretty bored with us. <laughs> <laughs> by the time they are done with us, they know them by heart. Um, so this is how his brain connectivity looks like. Again, the purple areas are the ones that are commonly uh, modulated in not benefiting responders and non-responders. The green ones are the ones that are modulated only in the responders. And you see here that there is extensive connectivity happening between these regions and it's practically normalized to a healthy level. So now this is a non-responder. Could you please play the videos? He is hiding behind the house. He is hiding behind the house. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. Hurry, Helen is far ahead. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone home because he is hungry. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. I have a friend whose home is a lighthouse. And the second one, please? This again about 450 minutes of the house. He is high behind the house. So pretty Early. much. No, it's not. Helen is it's far ahead. Nothing is perfect. <laughs> Helen is far better. He has gone home because he is hungry. He has gone because he is hungry. You, you can start I the video here. So, uh, and this is how the connectivity of these brain regions looks uh, like in this patient, this patient, so there's non-responders. As you see, there is not only a uh, lack of modulation, but there is also, um, they're not connected as densely as in responders. So, obviously, very specific uh, speech network targeting effect of the drug. So we think uh, that uh, in the pathophysiological pipeline of dystonia and laryngeal dystonia specifically, there is loss of inhibition, increased neural activity, and that's where sodium oxidate may be coming through, uh, as it shows direct effects, uh, on, not only on activity, but also on the network. So uh, this was a label study, and we're just done with our double blind, placebo control, randomized crossover study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we packed everything. We don't want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> we of course scan them, and we will have all this data. Uh, and I do hope that the double blind study.
that it will also replicate the findings or come close to the open label status. So I'll be happy to share these results sometime later. All right, to summarize, laryngeal dystonia has evolved to be a neural network disorder. Different forms of laryngeal dystonia likely follow divergent pathophysiological mechanisms. Specialized neural alterations may serve as powerful diagnostic and screening markers of laryngeal dystonia, and sodium oxalate um, seems to show direct effects on the pathophysiology of the disorder by acting on normal neural activity within the dystonic network. So that's uh, not the end of the story, um, because there is much more to do uh, for these patients. Um, there, we should not be thinking that only one treatment will cure everything or help with everything that's going on uh, across different phenotypes, genotypes, and so on. So identification um, uh, of other diagnostic markers uh, and therapies that selectively target the disorder pathophysiology is an important step toward better clinical management of patients with laryngeal dystonia and similar disorders. So um, coming through all these years, the road that looked like this started to look something like this. Um, and I think we, uh, as a field, know where we're going and that there is much more to explore and hopefully move um, all this knowledge to clinical practice um, and have um, translational impact. Thank you very much for your attention and invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And I also want to acknowledge all my uh, uh, lab team as well as extensive internal in internal collaborations that made all this work possible. Thank you.